Good morning. Welcome to Winchester Baptist Church's online service of worship this morning. Um, it's great to have you with us, whether you're joining on Facebook or if you're joining on YouTube uh, live or if you're joining later on in the week. It's great to have you here and you're so welcome. Uh, after today's service at 11 o'clock, we'll be meeting on Zoom for fellowship and a catch up. So it'd be great to have you um, with us there too. Uh, if you don't have access to the Zoom link, then please do message us or email us and we'll try our best to respond to you and help to you get involved so you can join us. Uh, but yeah, it's great to have you with us this morning and you're so welcome.
from the gift day last Sunday for Heather and Barry, they have sent out a summary of some of the work that they are involved in together, with details of how people can support them financially. Please consider prayerfully whether you could support them so that they can continue to serve God in this way. If you have any questions about their work, please get in touch with Heather and Barry. And if you need more details on how to give financially, please contact Ali Stanbrook. Thank you for your support. Father God, sustainer of all, just as we have prayed during the pandemic for your protection and strength for health and social care workers, today we pray especially for education staff as they support children and young people from preschool to university. Grant teaching and pastoral staff the skills and resources they need to deliver the curriculum in engaging ways while encouraging the emotional well-being and inclusion of all pupils. May every child and young person be able to access sufficient food and safe study space 
as well as vital opportunities in groups such as sport, music and drama. May they be protected in their online activities and blessed in their friendships and future plans. And as Little Treasures opens its doors again on Friday, may this be a place where young and old discover that they too can open the door of their hearts to your love and grace, made known to us through Jesus. To the glory of your name. Amen. Risen Christ, Redeemer of the world, thank you that the need for urgent change to tackle the climate crisis is being recognised more around the world. May politicians and organisations move from making headline-grabbing targets to plans for practical action and show us how we may all play our part, however small, in treading more lightly on the earth. Thank you too for the Black Lives Matter movement that challenges us to examine our attitudes and assumptions, calling us to work as allies. With the news this week of the conviction of a white police officer for George Floyd's murder, widespread racist abuse within the Church of England and the scandalous decision-making for Commonwealth war graves, may we continue to confront injustice and call for change. Guide us to look first at our own hearts and minds so that we do not speak out about a speck while ignoring the plank in our own eye. To the glory of your name. Amen. As we continue to pray, we turn our thoughts to people who have recently been bereaved. Following the death of Prince Philip, we remember the Queen and her family as they mourn the loss of a husband, a father, a grandfather and a great-grandfather. And in the same way, we bring before you people who are known to us personally, who are in the same situation, missing a loved one, recently departed. Lord Jesus, when you were with us, you said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Please send your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to bring peace beyond understanding to those who grieve. We pray that, whatever the circumstances of their bereavement, you will bring good memories of lives well lived and a sure and certain hope of an ongoing life with you. We ask that you would transform their grief into joy. And finally, we want to focus on hidden homelessness. At the start of the pandemic, concerns about the approximately 15,000 people who are counted as homeless in England led to the rapid provision of accommodation by central government and local authorities. However, this number is dwarfed by the estimated 100,000 people who are classed as hidden homeless. We pray for people who are in this situation, living in hostels or sharing temporarily with friends on their sofas or floors. These are often negative environments, full of chaos, with such people living with lack of choice or agency over their lives. They are faced with unclean living conditions and no security of accommodation from one night to the next. Lord, we pray that there would be help for these people in the form of support for their well-being, resolution for the situations that have led them into being homeless, and understanding that each and every person is precious in your sight. Lord, equip us for action and help us to be mindful of people like this who are so often out of sight and out of mind. In your name, Amen. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen.
reading comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples heard the wonderful news from the women and left for Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still had lingering doubts. Then Jesus came close to them and said, All the authority of the universe has been given to me. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you, and never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. Amen. The Great Commission. These verses that we've just had read to us form the basis of the third episode in our mini-series of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. Hudson Taylor, who founded the China Inland Mission early in the 19th century, famously said, The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. And subsequently, these verses were used to justify the great missionary endeavours of the 19th century. And since then, many sermons on the subject have stressed the fact that this is a command. However, while these sermons are designed to encourage Christians in their activities of sharing the gospel, they can actually have a discouraging effect. They can have a negative effect of just making you feel guilty. If this is a command, then am I sinning if I haven't gone out into the world to be a missionary? If I haven't done anything today which could be described as evangelism? In a modern day reiteration of Hudson Taylor's quotation, there was an article by Greg Laurie in Christianity.com last month, which said, We call it the Great Commission and not the Great Suggestion. Jesus didn't say, look, if you're in the mood, if it works into your busy schedule, as a personal favour to me, would you consider going into the world and making disciples? No, in the original language, this is a command. And he's absolutely right, but as I read more and more of his article, I felt more and more guilty. So if we're to avoid beating ourselves up for failing to obey what seems like a relatively straightforward command, it's important to understand a bit about the content of the command and also its context. So the content of the command and the first word of it is go. On the face of it, this word in English carries the idea of dropping what you're doing and going, going to another place, another vocation. But in the Greek original, the word used for go in this verse can have a much more general meaning, the way you go about your life. So this verse has more of a sense of sharing the good news as you go. In other words, the task of disciple making isn't something you go away to do, but something that you do wherever you go and in whatever you do. In your everyday life, you can make disciples. You don't actually need to go anywhere. Some people are called to be pastors, evangelists and missionaries as a professional vocation, and that's absolutely fantastic. But the vast majority of us are not and we will engage in Christian ministry through our chosen career path, here and now. Go and make disciples. We often think of the Great Commission, or, or I often think of the Great Commission, as telling us to go and preach the gospel to all nations. But actually, it talks of making disciples of all nations. And the goal of discipleship is more than the transferring of information or the saying of certain key words or the preaching of uh, certain sermons. The goal is to develop a heart for God, to know him and to love him. The Greek word for disciple is mathetes and literally this means a pupil or a learner. It's the word from which we get mathematics, the ultimate form of learning. Now if maths isn't your strong point, your heart may be sinking at this. How can I be a good disciple if I can't do differential equations? But it's actually misleading to think of discipleship in terms of being school pupils or students in the modern sense of the word. The modern educational model prioritises the head over the heart. It's all about what you know at the end of the lesson. But this was not the educational model in first century Palestine. 
The kind of teaching that Jesus had in mind takes place through modelling the Christian life before others. When he discipled his own followers in his earthly life, Jesus didn't sit down and lecture them for programmes of sermon series or anything like that. He lived with them. He shared his life with them. He was a role model. So making disciples isn't simply drilling information into non-Christians and young believers. A better translation of Mathetes is apprentice or mentee. It refers to a deeper, ongoing learning process. And if we're to make disciples, we should serve as mentors coming alongside others and showing them what it means to walk as a disciple of Jesus. It's important to note that the call is to make disciples and not make decisions. We often talk about leading others to make a decision for Christ. And such decisions are crucial to beginning the journey of following and learning from Jesus. But making a decision for Christ is not an end in itself. Rather, it's the start of a journey. And all young disciples need someone to accompany them on that journey. So just living out the life of a disciple in front of others is a key part of the mission to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. I was struck by Marcus's sermon on Easter Sunday when he spoke of the hope of the few being dashed on Good Friday, but the hope of the many being raised on Easter Sunday. And we are part of the many. It's only because those 11 disciples and many people after them obeyed that command that we are here today. You see, up to that point, Jesus' ministry had largely been with Jews in Palestine, but from here on in, it's to all people everywhere. The scope of the mission is now international. Jesus charged the disciples to take the mission to all nations, all ethnicities. And we can read about how they did that in the book of Acts, which can be summed up in a further version of the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where Jesus says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There isn't time to go through it now, but it's worth skimming through the entire book of Acts to see the various ways that the Christians spread the gospel throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the structure of the book. It starts off in Jerusalem and then it gradually moves out and ultimately it finishes in Rome, the, the capital city of the empire, which could reasonably be described as the ends of the earth. And the disciples did this mission by word and deed by preaching and living out Jesus' values, all sorts of different ways the word was spread throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to Rome. So that's what the core of the command, to live the life that Jesus wants, reinforced by the words of explanation where appropriate. That's what it's all about, wherever we are, wherever we may go. And at this point, I was tempted to quote the well-known quotation attributed to St Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. But when I looked it up, I discovered that St Francis never actually said those words, so I won't quote him. However, the sentiment is valid and it is consistent with what Francis did actually say. What he said was, it's no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. In other words, just seeing through hypocrisy, you know, practice what you preach, it would be the modern version of that saying. And the objective of our preaching of the gospel, whether it's by word or by the way we live, is so that others, whatever their background or ethnicity, may see and follow the role model of Jesus Christ exemplified in us. So that's a little bit unpacking the content of the command, but it's also important to think about the context of the command. And there are a few things I'd like to pick up on, the first of which in, is the, the fact that the commission was given in Galilee. Verse 16 says that the disciples went to Galilee because Jesus had told them to go there. The other post-resurrection appearances in this series, the ones we looked at last week and the week before, from Luke's Gospel and John's Gospel, all took place in Jerusalem. But this one takes place in Galilee, the place where it all started, the disciples' home region. They went there because Jesus had told them to go there in verse 10. 
And that was a command that Jesus had given them, and probably a relatively easy one to follow, certainly much easier than the command to go and make disciples of all nations. After a traumatic last week in Jerusalem, it would have been very tempting for these shattered disciples to go home, to start their lives again without Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel in particular, Galilee is the place where good things happen, Jesus' teaching and healing ministry. But Jerusalem is the place where bad things happen, opposition and death. But above all, Galilee was home. Jesus was deliberately sending them back to the stability and security of home, to the place of good memories, to launch the next phase of their lives. There are times when we need to consolidate before we can move on. After a difficult time, we need to go back to basics, to the green, green grass of home, as it were, simply to bask in the fact that God loves us without fretting about what we are doing. We just need to be. And then we can build the next steps on a firm foundation. The next bit of context I'd like to look at is the fact that the commission was given to the apostles as a group. And we can easily misinterpret this if we see it as a command for individual Christians to leave home for foreign fields in order to share the gospel. Of course, it is that. There is this sort of cross-cultural ministry, which is a clear part of what it means for the Great Commission to be fulfilled. And it's fantastic that some people are called to such mission activity. But as I said earlier, we can't all be. And we need to remember that this commission is given for all the disciples. It's not something that we can do alone. To illustrate this, part of the commission is to make disciples and baptise them. Now, how many of you have baptised anybody? It's not our role as individual Christians to baptise people. You as an individual Christian are not disobeying the command if you've never baptised anyone. That's something that is done corporately by the church, as represented by its ministers. You see, no one can fulfil the Great Commission alone in its entirety. There are no insignificant tasks in working towards this mission, but we all do it together. We all have a role to play, whether it's an upfront role of preaching or going out as a missionary, or simply a behind the scenes role of serving on a rota so that church life and ministry can run smoothly and the gospel can be proclaimed. Some form of commissioning of the disciples before Jesus' ascension appears in three other passages, as well as this one in Matthew. That's the one we had last week, uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 49. Then there's Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which I mentioned earlier, and also John chapter 20. And in all of these, the commission is given to the disciples as a group. A Canadian theologian, Michael Goheen, summed it up beautifully when he said, The Great Commission is not a task assigned to isolated individuals. It is an identity given to a community. We as a Christian community, our identity is that commission to serve God, to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. That is our identity as a community. A third element of context I, I'd like to explore is the fact that the Great Commission shouldn't be seen in isolation of the other commands of Jesus. It's not that this command is more important than Jesus' other commands. John Stott, in his book Christian Mission in the Modern World, beautifully articulated the relationship between the Great Commission and what Jesus described as the greatest commandment. And I'm going to quote John Stott verbatim. I venture to say that sometime, perhaps because it was the last instruction that Jesus gave before returning to the Father, we give the Great Commission too prominent a place in our Christian thinking. Please don't misunderstand me. I firmly believe that the whole church is under obligation to obey its Lord's commission to take the gospel to all nations. But I'm also concerned that we shouldn't regard this as the only instruction which Jesus left us. He also quoted Leviticus 19 verse 18, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And he called this one the second and great commandment. So we have two instructions of Jesus, a great commandment, love your neighbour, and a great commission, go and make disciples. The great commission neither explains nor exhausts nor supersedes the great commandment. What it does is to add to the requirement of neighbour love and neighbour service, a new and urgent Christian dimension. If we truly love our neighbour, we shall without doubt share with him the good news of Jesus. 
How can we possibly claim to love him if we know the gospel but keep it from him? Equally, however, if we truly love our neighbour, we will not stop with evangelism. If we love our neighbour as God made him, we must inevitably be concerned for his total welfare, the good of his soul, his body and his community. So you see, loving one's neighbour includes sharing the gospel. And proclaiming the gospel includes tangible demonstrations of loving one's neighbour. Both are a natural consequence of our own relationship with God. And the key to being able to love our neighbour and share the gospel with him is not to worry about legalistically obeying commands, but to cultivate that relationship with God so that the rest follows naturally. And the fourth element of context, which I think is really important, uh, so I'd like to conclude with this one, is that the commission was given in response to a mixed reaction to seeing Jesus. In verse 17, we read that some disciples saw Jesus and they worshipped him, but some doubted. And the word used for doubt is, is one meaning uncertainty and hesitation. It's a word that was used when Peter, when on, on the lake, when Jesus called Peter and Peter jumped out of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus and suddenly he lost his confidence and started to sink. Encountering Jesus and following him involves taking a risk, literally a step of faith into the unknown. And some of the disciples were unsure about this. So the, the commission itself was accompanied by words of reassurance from Jesus. All authority has been given to me. We are working with a powerful ally. Surely I am with you always. Jesus assured his disciples that he would be with them as they engaged in their mission, even until the end of the age. This Jesus, who appeared to his disciples in his resurrection body, assures them of his presence forever. But within weeks he had ascended into heaven, apparently leaving them. But before his ascension, Jesus informed the disciples that even when his physical presence had departed, he would send his spirit to comfort, teach and strengthen them. And that spirit continues to empower and embolden us who engage in his mission today. The promise that the disciples received is just as valid to us that Jesus will be with us always, even to the end of the age. These are the very last words of Matthew's Gospel, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. A fitting conclusion to a Gospel which started with the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. And a fantastic form of reassurance if we're struggling with the idea of living with Jesus' commission. So in that commission, Jesus commands every Christian to step out in faith and to spread the good news in some way, to make disciples. This is faith in action. It could be loving our neighbour or moving to another country to reach people there. It could be sharing with less fortunate people in our own city or spreading the word in a nearby town or just talking to our colleagues at work. Wherever we go, every faithful Christian is compelled to share the gospel. So what small or large steps can you take today, knowing that Christ will be by your side to make disciples of all nations? As you reflect on the command to make disciples of all nations, as you go about your daily business, it's worth reflecting also on its context. The command was given to disciples on home soil, a place of comfort. It was given to them as a group, not as individuals. It was given to complement, not replace, Jesus' other commands. And it was given in response to perfectly understandable hesitation with words of reassurance that Jesus, the one with authority and power, is right by our side. So I'd like to finish by reading these verses from the Message Translation, because I think that neatly brings out some of these themes, and it doesn't suffer from the over-familiarity that we tend to have when we read such well-known words. So from the message, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain that Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorised and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, 
Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day, right up to the end of the age. Amen.
you for joining us for today's service of worship. Uh, it's been great to have you with us. Hopefully you'll be able to join us next week. We'll be here at the same time and same place, so YouTube and Facebook. Uh, don't forget to log on to Zoom at 11 o'clock for fellowship and a catch-up. Um, have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless. <laughs>